Hello and welcome to the Planning for Learning online MOOC question and answer session. Um, we have Chris here with us, who is Hi. going to be sharing her expertise and answering the questions um, for those of you who have submitted them. So thank you very much for putting them through to us. We do appreciate it. Uh, and as always, it's great to get this opportunity to interact with you um, in this way, having been learning with you throughout the course. Uh, thank you to the National STEM Learning Centre for giving us this opportunity. And without further ado, we will crack on and start looking at the questions. Before we do, I am going to remind you to get a pen or pencil and a piece of paper, because as always, when we get time to sit down with an expert uh, uh, like Chris, um, you will end up finding lots of things that you wish to go away and investigate further, so you can make note of those as we listen to her answers. So, thank you. We're going to start, Chris, with question number one, which comes from Jude. Um, Thank you, Jude, for your question. This question is about regrouping pupils within and between lessons. Uh, Jude asks, how does regrouping actually work in practice? What are the risks involved um, in challenging learning environments? And can you ask any of your teachers to demonstrate how regrouping can work in particularly you know, challenging environments? So what advice have you got for Jude, Chris? Um, well, what I've seen working with teachers that have been on some of our projects um, is that as, as long as you're taking control and explaining to the students why you're doing it, if you're saying, you know, I'm going to put you in different groups today or I'm going to get uh, David and Tanya and uh, Louise and Yagnesh to work together today for a particular reason, then the kids are, are fine with it. They do do what you say, but you have to go in with a commitment to do it. If you go in and you sort of take your time and make a big fuss about moving kids around, then obviously you, you start to get problems, as you would with any classroom management procedure. Mm. So I think if you go in with a focus and let them know you're doing it because you, want, you think it's going to help them learn, maybe get some feedback from them, but has that helped you learn today? What, mm. What's been useful about today? Uh, and explain to them that they're also learning skills that they're going to be using for when they finish school. So mm. you know, you're going to have to work in teams in whatever job you do, whether you're working in... Uh, a shop or whether you're working in a factory or whether you're working uh, in uh, you know some sort of uh, other establishment you'll be working as teams so getting used to working with people and not always working with your friends is a good thing to do and something that maybe your teacher could actually write one of your references that you're actually very good at doing that sort of thing uh, and I always find um, when I get put in different groups in my work that what is really interesting is that I learn from those new people mm -hmm. Uh, because they bring to uh, funds of knowledge from their experience that I don't know. And that helps me move my learning forward. So I think if you treat it like that and let the kids know that that's why you're doing it, it tends to work. Lovely. Thank you, Chris. Lots of really good ideas there, Jude. Um, I was going to add that I have worked in challenging schools and got mm -hmm. grouping and regrouping to work, drawing on all of the things that Chris said. But one of the top tips I would do is have the groups already written up so I'd predetermined them from some evidence. And the kids I found generally would go into a group if it was already there rather than a negotiation that we tried to carry out in the classroom. So mm. lots of useful advice Saves there. time as well. Absolutely, absolutely. But it's that purposefulness, isn't it, Chris, that you were yeah. saying is a key thing. Yeah. Thank you, Jude. Um, our next question here is from Nidia. Nidia asks, what do we do with those students who, due to their behaviour, cannot make progress? Um what to do in groups where they may be too numerous or they haven't got a good stu study habit that might interfere with the work of others. So, Chris, thoughts on that one? Any approach to teaching and learning where you've got behaviour problems is going to be difficult because you need to overcome what's causing those behaviour problems. What was really interesting when we did uh, our project in Scotland, the Assessment Is For Learning project, uh, it was one of the things that the evaluation group reported on was how behaviour actually improved when they're doing assessment for learning. And that's because they became much more involved with what they were doing and so um, were, you know, had less time to sort of mess about. So it might be if you can get assessment for learning to work well, it might actually help behaviour. But you know, what you have to do is train the kids up so they know what's expected of them when they're working in groups. They know that they're expected to report back and they're reporting back for their group. So they have to take a part in it uh, and really just sort of keeping that going continuously so that they start to understand what you will and what you won't um, actually allow uh, when they're working in that way. It certainly is a, a better way of working and a more interesting way of working for them than giving them what I see many teachers do when children misbehave is giving them books to copy out of, textbooks to copy out mm -hmm. of. 
So, you know, I think that it's just um, putting up with their behaviour and getting them into working will be the best approach to it. Yeah, lovely. Thank you, Chris. Some really helpful ideas again. Um, thank you, Nidhi, for that question, because I know other people will have similar situations where they'll, they'll want some ideas, so we appreciate you asking that. Um, our next question comes from Warren. So Warren asks, what do you do with students who just refuse to be engaged with this style of learning? Where, you know, it's that taking their ownership, I presume, that Warren means, the stuff that we've been talking about throughout the course. Because they are extremely successful with traditional learning, which is expected of them um, in other classes. Another participant said it's about how you manage expectations that the teacher isn't just going to give them the information. Uh, mm. And especially, so that's that's one aspect of this. How do we get them to see that they need to own that learning? But then also Warren asks, how do you explain this to their parents who may have been educated in a similar way? Um, see that as successful teaching. Yeah, I think um, what's really important is that, particularly early on, but throughout the course when you're teaching them, um, you explain to them the sort of learning that they're doing. So, yeah, maybe somebody telling you the answer is okay if you want students who can just rote learn and regurgitate what the teacher tells them. But increasingly, both examinations and particularly in the workplace, you're expected to apply knowledge, you're expected uh, to evaluate and analyse and all those sorts of higher order skills that really can't come from a teacher just telling you, just telling you something and then you doing it. You need to actually work on it and you need to work on it with others so you're supported in actually developing your skills in those areas. Yeah. And I think parents do accept that. Certainly um, one of the things that you can do if you want some background for that is to look at any uh, of the government reports or OECD, for example, reports uh, that look at what we expect of learners uh, in uh, the 21st century. And certainly, you know, those sorts of skills like critical thinking, problem solving, etc., doesn't come from the sort of learning where a teacher stands at the front and just tells kids some facts that they learn. So uh, I think really it's actually establishing from early on what we mean by what is science knowledge and how mm -hmm. is the best way to acquire science knowledge and why we work in the way that we do. For example, practical work is absolutely essential mm -hmm. uh, in my estimation and in many other people's in terms of uh, trying to develop the sorts of science understanding that we want from our learners and being able to uh, discuss and talk about ideas that they've met maybe in theory through practical work uh, is really important. So that would be one particular example that wouldn't fit that sort of very traditional approach to teaching and learning that you alluded to. Yeah, lovely. Thank you, Chris. Um, so ideas there, Warren, to help you build that classroom culture and also, as Chris says, to discuss ideas with parents. Um, our next question comes from Yin. So Yin is discussing about their country and the context where they're at, that they've got different types of schools uh, with different conditions, depending on whether they're in city or rural areas. And Yin would like to know whether or not teacher performance um, from teachers who engage with CPD or who are not, what, what are the indicators for a successful teacher in these different school contexts? What, what thoughts do you have on that, Chris? Well, I mean, the research um, tells us that uh, one of the most important factors that determine whether students do well or not is the teacher in the classroom. So, you know, <laughs> good teachers uh, get good learning out of students. That's not surprising, is it? Mm -hmm. um, but what do we mean by good teaching? Well, good teaching is about developing interactions, uh, and uh, however you do that, um, that's what really is going to count. So I would look, if I was going to go into a school and see uh, how effective or how efficient I thought teachers were, I'd go and look at their interactions, both oral and written, but particularly oral. How are they interacting with the children? How are they listening to what the children are saying? And how are they discussing some of those ideas that maybe aren't totally uh, direct on what we actually expect the science or the maths knowledge to be? And how are they dealing with that in helping move children's ideas forward? So I think it's about, I think it does work in whatever type of school that you've got. It's just that you may need to set it up differently in different classrooms because some children are used to talking with adults and used mm. to talking with one another and others aren't. Maybe you need to do some training with them so they do become better at discussing in groups uh, and reaching a consensus and all those sorts of skills that come out of group work. Uh, one of the researchers who I think has done some really good work on this uh, is... Um, actually uh, Mercer, who's mm. uh, from the University of Cambridge, 
uh, and uh, he's done uh, talking together and talking through science ideas. And it's well worth going uh, onto his website and having a look at uh, some of the work that they've put forward for that, because that does develop that sort of group work behaviour mm -hmm. where language and interactions do get better and therefore children do learn better. Thank you, Chris. That's lovely. So that, I think it's really interesting that we're saying that the indication of successful teaching is going actually in the classroom and seeing the interactions. Mm. And because a lot of indicators are, are measures that actually don't really show that, do they? Um, and I'm also thinking about this course being about planning for learning. Mm. I suppose it would be how teachers plan for those interactions as well would be. Absolutely. So planning the questions, yeah. planning the activities that might actually encourage those interactions are all part of it. Yeah. So you could look at planning as well. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, Chris mentioning then about resources. I am sure that on the National STEM um, website, there's also lots of resources about talk that will yeah. help as well, um, getting those interactions going in your classroom. Um, so thank you, Yin. I hope that helps develop your thinking about what successful teaching looks like in practice in different contexts. So the next question we've got is from Guyan. Mm -hmm. Guyan's asking about collaborative teaching practice and how they relate to collaborative learning mm -hmm. and whether um, how can collaborative learning be judiciously used to avoid time constraints placed for completions of particular courses, of curricular, I imagine. Okay, so we've got that four-letter word again, time, always comes up. Whenever you're doing any new intervention, mm -hmm. um, people always worry about time. And I think overall, I'd, my answer to that is always the same. You need to spend the time getting it going and then you get paid back later because mm -hmm. kids actually learn faster and can learn new things better. Uh, but I'm not too sure what you mean by collaborative teaching practices. If you mean teachers organising children into groups to work, uh, then mm -hmm. yeah, you need to get well organised to think mm -hmm. about how you're going to do that. For the collaborative learning to take place. But you might mean uh, teachers actually collaboratively working together. Uh, and certainly we find on many of our projects that actually when we do our CPD sessions or our, our, our teacher meetings, getting teachers to work in the same way that we expect students to work help teachers to understand what that behaviour is like in the classroom, how you set it up and what it feels like to learn in that way. So it is different learning in a collaborative environment to learning when the teacher's at the front directing the learning from the board. It's a very, very different sort of feeling. And teachers need to learn how you uh, work with those skills and how you pick up on maybe children who might become a bit distracted or children maybe who feel uncomfortable in one group or another. And what do you actually do about that? And they only really can get that from experiencing it themselves as well as think about how it will work in the context of their classroom. So collaborative teaching, yep. Yeah. I think uh, you do need that in classrooms because it's when children work in groups mm. that they start to use one another mm. as a resource. Uh, and uh, that's really important in terms of bringing in ideas, getting to share ideas and bounce ideas off one another. So they start to understand what they really do and don't understand rather than doing what they often do when it's a teacher-directed type learning where they just try and memorise what the teacher said. Uh, in working in uh, mm. collaboration with others, they're much more likely to change their ideas and to remould and reshape their ideas to be something more like the ones that we would actually want rather than being, can I remember it? Is it, is it respiration the opposite of photosynthesis? <laughs> right, rather than think about really what is respiration, rather than think about it being different from something. They think, right, what is respiration? What does me say about it? Do I believe mm -hmm. that? Can I build on that? So a much, much better way to learn. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Guyan, for that. I, I completely echo what Chris has said. I often, when I do CPD with teachers, ask how they've learnt, and I get all of the things that Chris has said, and only once has anybody ever said anything that I said, which I think is really funny. Um, so it's actually from each other that they, you know, as Chris said, that they actually yeah. really find that they learn well. Um, okay, so uh, our second question then from Guyan. What are some of the demerits of self-reflection in teaching, um, particularly using recorded videos, and how can assessment for learning be used in a more innovative way in science or STEM subjects? Because obviously we've looked particularly at maths on this planning for learning course. Um, if you talk about self-reflection as a, a form of self-assessment, self-assessment sometimes doesn't work well if it's done sort of superficially where uh, you actually are just using self-assessment as rather a checklist way. Mm -hmm. Like, am I doing this? Yeah. Have I got that? Have I got the other? Uh, it's not deep enough. self uh, reflection or self-assessment really needs you to uh, consider last time you worked in this area and how you were performing then, what you were doing then, 
and then doing a very careful analysis of what you're doing now, looking at the difference between them. So it's not just a checklist, it's much more an understanding of how you move forward and progress mm -hmm. and what you can do now that you couldn't do previously. Um, and certainly if you're working with children, they need help with that because they're not used to doing that. Mm. They're used to you, the teacher, telling them what progress they've made. So I think, you know, working on ways of doing it rather than just have, I can do this, I can do that, and children mm. ticking it off, it's actually moving on to explaining why that is and, and what's the evidence to show that they now are better at drawing graphs um, or um, reading the, the Burette in science uh, whatever it is, why they, how they know that, what's the evidence for that compared to what they did before. So rather than I can do this, it's I now can do this because I can do mm. it this way. It's a much better way of, of looking at it. Lovely. Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you, Guyane, for that question. And moving on now to Hannah. So Hannah asks, if schools are poorly resourced, um, what are the ways you can still provide rich experiences for children? Um, by poorly resourced, I'm assuming you need mean books and equipment and so on. Mm. Um, as I said earlier, the most important resource in the classroom, uh, well, there's two actually, one is mm. the teacher, the second is the other students that's in there. So uh, finding ways of getting uh, the students to bring uh, their funds of knowledge from their own experiences uh, and utilising that is a, a really good, good way to do it. Um, when I was a teacher, which is uh, quite a while ago, full time, uh, you know, I, I, I always used to like to find kids in my various classes who'd got particular interests that we could actually draw on. Mm -hmm. So I remember one child was an absolute whiz uh, in terms of when he'd been at primary school learning about dinosaurs. <laughs> so uh, dinosaurs used to get brought into lots of our lessons for all sorts of things. So not just when we're talking about reptiles in biology, but certainly when we're talking about size and scale mm -hmm. when we're doing some subjects. Uh, and even when we were talking about food chains, we actually did uh, food chains and food webs uh, for when it, when dinosaurs were around and worked some of those out because he got such a great interest to tell us so many things about what at what uh, and so on. So I think, you know, drawing on, on what they know and can do and using that uh, is, is one way of getting around it. Uh, the other thing that I saw um, in some work I was doing in primary schools only this week was they started doing a science at home activity and for those kids who maybe haven't got uh, a lot of access to computers, etc., mm. they just got them to watch particular television programmes that have got some science in them. And they came back and reported on that. So at the moment in the UK, we just had a yet another wonderful series mm. by David Attenborough. Uh, and so some of the kids watched that with their parents. And then the child actually reported back both on what they and their parents had actually mm. learned. And then they got their science at home uh, sticker, which is what they were after. So I think, you know, there's other ways of doing it besides always thinking, I can't do this unless I've got, you know, ammeters and burettes mm. and microscopes and things. There's other ways of actually uh, thinking about trying to use knowledge and experience that children have got mm. in order to build that into an interesting lesson. Lovely. Thank you, Chris. I'm just thinking if there's any, that's, if there's any other resources that are out there. I'm sure there was something... Um, Teaching abroad, there was like a teaching abroad physics pack. I think the IOP might have produced it or somebody. Mm. I don't know. Um, but there are things out there, aren't there, with, to do with yeah, the yeah. kit. And uh, Association of Science Education has a journal called ASC International with ideas, mm. particularly for international schools. And some of those, obviously, are, are not uh, necessarily mm. uh, poorly resourced uh, countries that, that things are going to. But there's certainly some good ideas into uh, working on that. And again, British Council mm. produced quite a lot of materials uh, for certain countries so it might be worth looking into those lovely thank you chris that's really helpful okay so those are the questions that we've had submitted um i want to say thank you to jane and yasmin our course mentors because they've also pulled together some themes and topics of discussion that they've come across while uh, interacting with various participants throughout the course so we're going to have a look and discuss ideas from what they've been picking up uh, it's been coming out quite a lot, I think, from the questions that you've asked and Chris's advice and discussions about group work. Um, so one of the themes that they've pulled out is that sometimes people are worried about group talk and oral work um, and that people might not be writing, you know, the pupils might not be writing some things down. Um, you know, it's, that there's this concern that they might forget their learning if it's emphasised that we're learning more through talking and not through writing, um, particularly when schools are expecting to see evidence in books now as proof of learning. So what are your thoughts on that, Chris? 
Um, well, there's obviously some things you sometimes do need to make a note of. Um, just like I have a shopping list. If I, if I, if I don't actually write my shopping list, I, I can never think what I need in the supermarket. But if I write it, I don't even have to have my shopping list with me. Mm-hmm. It's they're just sort of key, key bits that I've got to sort of remember as I'm going round. So maybe that's the way to treat the sort of things you need, the students need to record. So ask them to write down what, what, what's three important things from this lesson or, or maybe you list certain words that they need to include and ask them just to write a summary uh, mm-hmm. for a few minutes um, so that they actually can record something down. And that does two things. One is it makes them go back mm-hmm. and think through and they can put their ideas down and you can then check whether that really does fit with what you hope that they'd actually learn. <laughs> but the other thing uh, that uh, it can do is it can satisfy uh, those people in your school who want to check uh, that something has been going on in your lesson because the kids have written this mm-hmm. down. And that, that might not necessarily just be your head teacher or your head of subject, but it might be parents want to know something's mm-hmm. happened because when mm-hmm. children come home and uh, both Andrew and I uh, yeah. remember our own children coming home, you know, what have you learned at school today? You know, they nothing. used to say nothing or stuff. <laughs> yeah. You know, what does stuff mean? You say, well, what, 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 what stuff have you learned? And they go, well, you know, science. And it just takes so long to get through to those bits. So maybe sort of occasionally seeing something in their book just mm-hmm. reassures parents. Uh, but it's... It's the learning, it's, it's, it's the discussion and sorting out the ideas that's really important. Um, you, know, they can actually, you can actually give them a sheet later of if you want to actually say, so what are the six main ideas mm-hmm. within magnetism or what's, you know, whatever it is. That they can either get later or they can find from a textbook or you can actually set that as a homework to follow on if you want. But the most important part is, is the talk because that's when the weird ideas get sorted out and children have sometimes quite weird ideas in science and mathematics about why things are as they are. That's lovely. Thank you, Chris. I, you know, I think your idea of getting them to summarise, that's really powerful because it's showing you about their learning, isn't it? Not just copied text in books. Yeah, well, I say with the pre-service teachers I work with, um, because when you're an inexperienced teacher, it's very, very hard to judge uh, the length of activities and so on. So they often run out of time to do the, mm. the plenary for the lesson that they've planned. So uh, I always give them an emergency plenary, which is to write down two things you've learned today. Mm. Uh, and, you know, again, it, it's quite useful because they've got to stop and think back, but really you, you can just nip around and see, gosh, they thought they'd learned that or <laughs> what I taught them. But, you know, it's a, it's a good assessment opportunity as well as being mm. a quick finish to the lesson and summing up what you've done. Yeah, I've started doing it with science keywords. So distill the lesson for me or condense it down or boil it down or evaporate it. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking, could you do it with maths keywords just so that the kids are using the mm-hmm. keywords as well? Mm-hmm. Summarise or, yeah, sum up. Anyway, comments have been put about teachers worried about students' dialogue going off topic. Mm-hmm. And this is interesting because, again, because this is a planning for learning course, one of the things coming out is how strict should my activity timings be in sticking to the plan and how do I decide what's an interesting topic that might be related to the student's own interest or what is actually irrelevant and are they taking us off course? Mm. So thoughts about that, Chris? About One thing that does help in schools where this has gone well is when teachers have worked together with one another. So somebody's brave and the sort of pioneer teacher who tries out a new way of doing things. And then they either invite colleagues in to mm. see bits of that lesson or they talk to their colleagues about how something's gone. So that you start to see which particular bits do interest or do stimulate talk, etc. Mm. And you can play on that. Obviously, every class is going to be different. So what might interest a class one day might not 100%, but you can, you can, you can judge from, you know, what's the thing of real interest. And you can bring in things like you can say, you know, in Miss Allsop's lesson yesterday, they talked about this. What do you think? So it's actually stimulating that talk if your class is not uh, actually talking very much. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I would try and, and think about your timing, although you know, I although I see teachers doing it really well, I would never be able to use these timers that they use on their interactive whiteboards because I find time is plastic in my lessons. So I might say to them they've got five minutes, mm. but if the talk is really productive, that five minutes might be actually ten minutes. But equally... If I say five minutes and after two minutes, mm. they're not really doing very well with it, either because I've not prepared them well enough, given the right vocabulary, or maybe it's just not stimulating the way that I expected, I move on. But I think you need to be aware of time and to think, but to actually look particularly at the way that they're responding. Because assessment for learning is really about responsive teaching. Mm. It's, it's responding to uh, how the ideas are actually um, helping move their ideas forward. 
Um, so, you know, I think um, it takes a time. What I've seen teachers do really well is when they've had, um, so sharing is one thing with the teacher, but if, you, if you're there on your own, uh, some teachers try it out with one class. It might not even be the same year group. Right? Mm. You might try it out with your 15-year-olds first and get it sorted out. And then you can go back and try it out with your 14-year-olds who don't know so much science or mathematics. But you actually know how a year on they might be able to respond to it. And that gives you some sort of key into how it actually might work. So you might use other classes for sampling that bit of learning before you try it with the class you really want it to work with. Yeah, lovely. Thank you, Chris. Um, so we've got a couple of topics, I think, that come out regularly on our um, question and answer session. So time's one of those we've already had, but I think these next two themes that are coming out in particular we get often. Um, so this one here is about um, teachers worried about getting students to own their learning and, th and, and, you know, at which point do we simply just give them the correct science explanations and move on? It's kind of the theme that's coming on. When do I tell them or when do I help them generate that learning themselves? Yeah, there's always going to be those definitions in science or those explanations of science that uh, are there in the textbooks and that, that maybe you want the students to have. So, you know, if they've got so far and it's not quite getting to your uh, explanation for why do um, metal boats float, uh, even though they, you know, metal seems to be quite heavy, seems to be quite dense, and they haven't actually got there. It might be that you have to come in with some sort of definition of density mm. and build it around the other way. So, you know, you see how far they can get and then you try and then build it back up again. So sometimes... Um, you might need to do that. But I, I think of it rather in a different way. I mean, the one for me that uh, I always used to find really hard was, unless a kid knew what friction was, it was actually very hard to explain to kids what friction was. Mm. You could show them, but, you know, what, what's the definition of friction? It's actually quite hard to give mm. that. But if you ask them something like, some people say the opposite of friction is slipperiness, what do you think? That creates quite a discussion about mm. what's going on. They sort of know this thing called friction, but what is it? Or if you say to them, do you think friction is the same on the moon as on Earth? And that becomes a discussion. You learn, you and they learn far more about what they really believe. And if you're trying to get round to thinking about things like balanced forces and so on, you'd only get round to that if you actually get them to move past uh, it's, you know, but it, friction is something that stops something moving. You've got to go past that. And so you need those better questions to get there. So I would say, yeah, have your definitions and so on, but keep them for when you need those. Rest of the time, start talking around and, and thinking about applying those ideas to a variety of contexts and seeing do they really understand what that definition means rather than mm -hmm. can they actually just wrote, uh, recall that particular definition. Yeah, that's lovely. I was reading um, a book recently about teaching effective physics, which was aimed probably at lecturers at, at, at FE, but the principles are relevant for English uh, for teaching in secondary schools. And they were saying that, you know, English lecturers, teachers, don't read the textbook in the lesson. That's your homework. And then we mm. apply and use it. So yeah. maybe we get them looking at keywords and definitions as well at home. Yeah, yeah. And then using it in the lesson rather than doing the lesson with the keywords. I just thought it was an interesting idea. And that's a very Japanese way. way of working. That yeah. They do it like that. They do all the, the, the talk is in the lesson and the rest of the stuff is outside. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Lots so in maths, they do the calculations outside. Then they come in and they discuss some more problematic type questions mm. rather than just sitting there working through 20 questions on percentages, for example. Yeah. Nice, nice ideas there, Chris. Thank you. Uh, as I say, that does come up often, that idea. Now, the next one comes up often too, um, which is the issue of curriculum coverage. Um, it's mm -hmm. that depth versus breadth argument, which we get often, don't we? So I know that Chris and Dylan have, have talked about this previously on other Q&As, but it's a theme coming out again from our planning one because um, teachers are asking if I'm planning and I'm finding they're not covering it, what do I do? So how do we, particularly with exam groups where everything is covered in a relatively short time, make sure that we, how do we prioritise what we teach in depth? I think the most important thing to do is to find out where the kids are at mm -hmm. before you actually start off. So spend some time at the beginning finding what they already know rather than reteaching from the beginning. So again, if we talk about forces, they do know a force is a push or a pull or a twist. Mm -hmm. They do know that it, it changes the speed and they do know it changes the direction of something or maybe it deforms something. So they know all those things. So you don't need to do that. That's already there. You need to move on from that to think about, so what's next? Um, 
One of the best ones was in the original project we did on assessment for learning way back in 2000, which is when the teacher actually gave the kids, um, this was uh, um, 11 year olds had just come up from primary school, uh, and he gave them the end of topic test in the first lesson Hmm. and asked them to just go through that test, not to answer it, but just to say, which of these questions do I think I can answer and get it right? Mm -hmm. Which are the ones that and I've heard of this thing within the question, but I'm not sure of the answer really. Which are the ones I've never heard about? And they just traffic liked it in green, yellow, or red uh, in that category. And he then just planned the work based on the ambers and reds and accepted that they knew the greens. Mm. And hey, he gave them a test at the end. Uh, this was after six weeks, so I, d- I doubt they'd have memorized that test from the beginning. Uh, and they did significantly better than his previous class who'd done that particular one because he'd focused on the things that they needed to move them forward didn't reteach things that it already got that's fabulous fabulous lovely great thank you chris and a lovely idea there so our next theme that's come out from across the course is about differentiation um so planning to intervene and being flexible but teachers being worried that um if i do that then students are going to are going to learn at different speeds so how do we manage for the student who's in front working a lot faster than those slowly at which point do i stop and move on to the next topic I think rather than thinking about it being a race and some getting there before others, it's thinking about it in more in three dimensions. So some might pick up the ideas quickly. So you can move them on to maybe um, looking at things within different contexts and trying things out in a different way. While you're still trying to get those who are struggling to get the idea, uh, maybe you need to take a, a simpler way forward with, with, with some of those students. It's also about getting them to share because sometimes a child does actually understand it but maybe they haven't quite got the language to articulate that so working with another student or two uh, they might be able to find that language to actually explain that thing I've seen that happen um, with balancing for some moments that you know a kid can balance a seesaw uh, and they actually know uh, where they're going to move the mass to but what they can't do is actually put it into words Mm. whereas working with others they find those words and those steps to do it and when we do it on the board and go through it quickly or do it through a demonstration, we go too quick for sometimes mm. those kids mm. to actually keep up with the language as well as the thinking that goes along. So uh, giving that time to do that will actually help those kids. At the same time, it consolidates those children who have got the ideas because they're having to check that what's being explained is explained in a way that makes sense and is logical and goes stepwise. So I think really... Um, you know, I'm not saying at the end they all will know exactly the same. They won't. Mm. Some will be more confident. Some mm. will still have some areas that are uh, that are rather um, sort of fuzzy. And some will have bits missing. And that that's always happens. But what differentiation does is it moves everybody forward. And that's what we actually want in class. It's not mm. just, you know, if we don't want to, we're not just moving the bright kids, the ones who pick it up quickly forward. We're moving everybody forward. Uh, and what's happened with assessment for learning, when we've looked at that, it's usually the lower end that make the most progress. Mm. Uh, so everybody moves forward, your average moves up, but the average moves up because the tail moves up significantly when you're actually doing this. Because those children start to understand the learning, understand what learning means, and that's when they start to put the effort in, and that's when they move mm. forward very fast. Lovely. Thank you, Chris. That's really helpful. The only th- other thing I was going to add is that we have got a sister course, yeah, uh, Differentiation for Learning which will be running again uh, 25th of February. So if you haven't, and that's 2019. Uh, so if you haven't done that course, then all of these ideas and principles that Chris has just talked about, we exemplify in classrooms with our teachers in primary and secondary showing how it can be actually achieved. Yeah, and some, there's some very good strategies on that course yeah. that's come out of schools that actually get differentiation working really well and yeah. working properly, not just sticking kids into groups, but actually giving them tools that actually help them move forward. Yeah, so everyone learns. Thank you. Uh, Our last theme then, so our um, planning for learning course, one of the things that we've talked about in particular is, you know, in terms of the the research field, is those three questions that come out of Hattie, the where am I going, how am I doing, what next? Um, And talked about the power of learning intentions as something that drives forward that dialogue in the classrooms for students and the teachers so they can plan for that. Uh, So the thing that's coming out is how can we make sure that the sharing of these learning intentions doesn't just become arbitrary, mechanical and and meaningless, Um, particularly in an environment, so maybe in a a culture where schools are expected to share them at the start of every lesson and they're written down in exactly the same way. So how can we challenge that to make them powerful for our pupils and teachers? 
I agree. Routines can be problematic. I mean, you need routines sometimes to get children working a particular way. But if you're just using a routine for the sake of using the routine rather than using it in a purposeful way, uh, then it doesn't work. Um, I think one of the most important things that I've ever written in many books and papers that I've written was one hour, uh, a piece I wrote with Sally Howard on in Inside the Primary Black Box. This is where we talked about consistency of principle, not uniformity mm-hmm. of action. All right, because what is really important is that uh, however you do it, you want the children to know what it is that's expected of them in the lesson. That's what a learning intention is. So, you know, we're going to be learning about this today. They need to know something about whatever the mm-hmm. topic is. So, you know, let's say we're doing fractions in maths. Uh, and, you know, by the end of the lesson, what I hope you do is to do this. But also as you're going through the various activities you're doing, maybe trying to relate those to saying, okay, so which of these uh, learning intentions have we worked on so far? What Which ones actually fit with what we've just done? Which ones do you feel that you've actually mm-hmm. achieved? Uh, or even sometimes not having the learning intentions there till part way through the lesson and say, so what do you think our learning intention has been so far? So I certainly wouldn't want to have the situation where you know, every lesson they're put on the board, the kids copy them down, you get into it, because that's just a routine for having a start in your book. What we actually want is the kids to be thinking about, so what am I doing? Why am I doing this? How am I learning? Uh, what can I what what I learned now that I didn't know before? That's really the whole purpose behind learning intentions. And that's really the way that teachers should work with them rather than being just something that's demonizing your planning. They are really important for planning though, because what they do is they actually help you focus your activities. Mm-hmm. So the children are doing, you know, if you want them to evaluate or analyze or apply knowledge, they are doing that, not just doing that bit of knowledge. So I think the more important really for the planning than for the action in the classroom. But I have seen teachers using learning intentions in a very innovative and active way in the classroom, and that has helped learning. Lovely. Thank you, Chris. So that's it then for this question and answer session. Um, Thank you for everybody who has submitted questions. They were really helpful. Um, Thank you for Jane and Yasmin um, as our mentors for pulling out the themes because, you know, that's things that come across everybody in the course. As I say, it's such a privilege and an honour to sit down and get ideas out out of Chris Um, in this interactive way on the course so it gives you a richer experience Um, for me the things I think that have come out particularly on this course about planning is is about being planning to be explicit I think Chris Mm. has talked about that explicitness whether it's about your grouping about the teaching approaches you're using about what you're wanting students to be learning throughout the lesson um, and also planning to be flexible whether that's with times or how you use yourself in the classroom or how you use the students in the classroom or the activities that you use. So it doesn't have to be the same diet for all our students. And it was interesting, Chris, because you mentioned about, you know, time comes up every time. But you talked about sometimes slowing down that pace of learning actually to help learners rather than just rushing through it mm. and, and thinking about how we use time effectively. I think the theme that came out strongest for me was um, about who are the most powerful resources in the classroom and it's it's you as the teacher and how you use yourself and plan to use yourself in that learning environment but also how you plan to use those pupils mm. as learning resources for each other so that they come to see the benefits of themselves as a learner of each other's as learners of their environment that they're in as learners because ultimately and you said this several times it's about not just getting through a curriculum but them as lifelong learners for the skills that they're going to need to be successful in the future those critical problem solving team working skills and that actually in STEM subjects we have a great opportunity for making that work effectively and that responsive teaching which is everything that underpins assessment for learning and you planning for that actually can really help them be successful so many thanks to Chris for giving us her time and expertise we just wouldn't have the same level of experience without her here um Thanks to Matt in the background as ever supporting us, the National STEM Learning Centre for this opportunity and for Dylan as well as one of our educators on the courses who, again, provides so much rich learning environments for us and experiences. So we wish you all a very Merry Christmas and look forward to seeing and supporting you on the next course. We have our new introduction to AFL course um, starting next year on the 21st of January where um, we'll be looking at the key principles that underpin all of this formative practice that Chris has talked about and how we can engender these interactive classrooms, in particular looking at this um, dialogue and interactions that Chris has talked about, how we can plan for that and use 
questioning particular hinge point questions. And then we mentioned already that differentiating for learning is going to run again and planning for learning will run again in the future if you or your colleagues want to engage with it, having taken on board the other courses we have done. So thank you very much.